Hi, I'm Kathleen Digri. I'm at the University of Utah in the Department of Neurology and Ophthalmology. And I'm Brad Katz. I'm in the Departments of Ophthalmology and Neurology at the University of Utah. And we're both from the Moran Eye Center, and we're excited today to try to give you a practical approach to your patients with eye pain and photophobia. And particularly, we want to look at the melanopsin pathway. Uh, my disclosures are that I'm part of inventor on a patent pending, uh, and I have some royalties from three textbooks, one on eye pain. And I hold uh, two patents uh, regarding the treatment of uh, photophobia with optical filters and nanoparticles. I'm also CEO of Axon Optics, which is a company that sells eyewear for the treatment of photophobia. So our objectives today are to give you some ideas about the basic history and examination of eye pain and photophobia, and then be able to identify those causes of eye pain and photophobia, and importantly, outline treatment options for your patients. And above all, we want you to realize that providers need to know how to evaluate and treat eye pain and chronic photophobia. So we're gonna start with a case. Uh, this is a 34 year old woman with light sensitivity causing eye pain. She has a history of migraine with aura in high school and she's been really relatively healthy until now. She began having some insomnia uh, and she started to develop pain over eyes and face. And it first started with sunlight then it progressed to indoor lighting, and now she's incapacitated at home with her lights off, not going anywhere. She's seen three neurologists, three ophthalmologists. Uh, some have even said she's got a somatoform disorder. She has been diagnosed with dry eyes, but she's referred to you. And uh, we've done an eye examination with the visual acuity and the fundus being normal. The neurologic examination is normal. Well, what is causing the eye pain induced by light and how am I going to approach this patient? I think the first step is doing a careful eye pain photophobia history. And that means taking a careful family history. Not only do you wanna know about a migraine family history, but other pain disorders, like do they have fibromyalgia or an autoimmune background? Then you want a life history. Is this new? old? When did it start? When did it get worse? What life events happened along the way that may have been associated with stressful life events or something like that? Then we want to understand what it feels like now. What's going on continuously or intermittently and how long does it last? Particularly, we're going to go after migraine symptoms, a headache that's associated with light and sound sensitivity, nausea and or vomiting that worsens with activity. We're going to really query about autonomic symptoms like redness, swelling around the eye or lid, tearing, rhinorrhea, nasal stuffiness, ptosis or meiosis. And we're going to look for things that make it worse, eye movements, the position of the head or neck or the eyes, exercise or touching the face. And then of course, the medical history is extremely important. A history of a traumatic brain injury uh, could, could generate new photophobia and eye pain. Obesity, snoring, autoimmune disorders, malignancy, vascular disease, depression and anxiety are also important to ask about. And don't forget a medication history. There are many medications that can make dry eyes worse like diuretics, uh, antihistamines, anticholinergics, some antidepressants, narcotics, stimulants. Uh, think about the medications that somebody is on and whether they could be affecting this story. So Dr. Katz, what do you look for when you see a patient who has eye pain and photophobia? So in addition to a complete ophthalmic exam, when you have a patient with eye pain and photophobia, there are some other uh, specific things that I'm going to add to my examination that I wouldn't ordinarily do. And so um, I'm going to take, you know, an extra careful look at the pupils and I'm going to look at the eyelid position to see if there's any uh, proptosis or lid lag that would clue you into thyroid eye disease. Sometimes palpating around the eye, especially around the trochlea, could clue you into trochleitis, which is an uncommon cause of uh, eye pain. Um, you know, a, a neurologist trick is to tap over the occipital nerves 
uh, in the back of the head to see if that recreates some of the eye pain, because sometimes patients with irritation of the occipital nerves will have referred pain into their eyes or their eye socket. Uh, and then another trick you can do is you can uh, do a superficial compression of the superficial temporal artery or the supraorbital artery or the infraorbital artery to see if that improves the patient's pain, because that can kind of clue you in that there's a vascular component, oftentimes migraine, that's contributing to their pain. And then, you know, and then the, at the slit lamp, looking for any signs of uh, intraocular uh, inflammation. The other trick that I will sometimes do is I'll take a cotton tipped applicator, and while the patient's eyes are closed, you can just gently palpate over the globe at the insertions of the uh, superior and inferior recti and the uh, medial and lateral rectus muscles looking for myositis, which can be a cause of eye pain, uh, usually with eye movement, but not always. Uh, and then finally, uh, some patients uh, that have cervical paraspinal muscle spasm will get um, referred pain into their eyes. It's often seen after like a whiplash injury. Um, and so I, I, I'll sometimes just uh, ask the patient if I can palpate their neck muscles. And boy, you'd be surprised at how many tense, rock hard uh, cervical paraspinal muscles you can run into. That, and, the, and patients may not necessarily know that their neck is bothering them, especially if it's a chronic problem, but that can definitely be a source of referred pain into the eye and the eye socket. Thank you. That's very helpful. So, red eye pain, uh, we in general, think this is usually an ophthalmologic problem. What kinds of things can cause a red eye that you would see in ophthalmology? Yeah, I agree. Like if you're um, not an eye doctor and you're seeing any signs of uh, redness, uh, inflammation, uh, or if the patient is reporting a foreign body sensation, um, these things should really be best evaluated by your um, neighborhood ophthalmologist because uh, they really have the examination tools and techniques to quickly rule out this list of uh, possibilities here like scleritis and keratopathy and conjunctivitis, which could be causing the eye pain and the light sensitivity. Great. But there are also some important neurologic causes of eye pain and photophobia, like a Horner's with a carotid dissection can give you referred pain into the eye. Uh, a cavernous sinus thrombosis could present with multiple cranial nerve palsies, um, elevated intraocular pressure, and a red uh, proptotic eye. Uh, the Telosa Hunt syndrome is a idi uh, idiopathic syndrome of inflammation in the cavernous sinus that can present with abrupt onset eye pain and uh, uh, ophthalmoplegia. Uh, a carotid cavernous fistula uh, if it's traumatic and it's between the internal carotid artery and the cavernous sinus, causes a very dramatic uh, red eye, bulging eye, uh, ophthalmoplegia, redness, uh, but a small, um, a low flow fistula between one of the dural uh, branches of the meningeal arteries uh, and the cavernous sinus can be very subtle. You can have just a little bit of ophthalmoplegia, a little bit of redness, a little bit of pain. So those can be really tricky. Those are typically uh, uh, in middle-aged women and they open spontaneously. They're not associated with trauma. And then uh, lastly, the trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias are a really important cause of eye pain uh, that can be accompanied by autonomic symptoms like tearing, eye redness, Horner syndrome, nasal stuffiness, or uh, a runny nose. And they can often be confused with trigeminal neuralgia. Yes. And sometimes you'll find eye pain is accompanied by visual loss. And in those cases, you want to think about optic neuritis, like with pain with eye movement, sometimes inflammatory diseases of the eye, like iritis, uveitis, scleritis, and intermittent glaucoma. Uh, inflammatory orbital disease also can present with eye pain and visual loss, as can sinus disease. Meningitis usually has fever and stiffness of the neck and other things that we might want to consider. Uh, vasculitis, like giant cell arteritis or polyangitis, can present with eye pain and visual loss, and it's usually an ischemic type. 
Don't forget about uh, pituitary apoplexy uh, and a uh, pituitary tumors can just present with photophobia uh, and, uh, and orbital disease, looking for proptosis and other findings of orbital disease may be all, also important. And finally, vascular diseases like aneurysm, ischemic ocular syndromes also can present with eye pain uh, and visual loss. The neurologic signs can also occur with eye pain and a painful third nerve palsy can, can be a simple microvascular third nerve palsy and diabetes, but it could also be the um, compression or even rupture of an aneurysm causing painful third nerve palsy with or without pupillary involvement. And again, pituitary apoplexy. Also tumors, pituitary tumors, meningiomas, infections, demyelination, and infla inflammation uh, can be very important. Uh, so it's important to do a careful neurologic examination, uh, looking at all the cranial nerves carefully. I think eye pain with a normal eye and normal neuro exam is sometimes the hardest, uh, especially in ophthalmology, this is hard. So if, if you have somebody with that, you really want to be thinking about migraine and asking all the questions about migraine, about cluster or the trigeminal not autonomic cephalalgias. But what do you think about other eye conditions that have normal eye exams and normal neuro exams, Dr. Katz? Yeah, dry eyes can be uh, really tricky. They're very, it's a very common problem. Um, uh, and, you know, most people that have dry eyes, they go to the grocery store and they buy artificial tears. They don't come to the neurologist's office or the ophthalmologist's office. They take care of it themselves. But it's the people that have atypical presentations of dry eye, like eye pain and photophobia, that end up in your examination chair. And so you just have to be cognizant of that and realize that um, uh, patients can have atypical uh, um, symptoms from dry eye syndrome. They don't always just present with the dry, itchy, scratchy, burning. And then uh, patients with eye strain because they've got the wrong glasses or because their eyes aren't converging properly on the printed material. It's kind of a, the, the term we use in ophthalmology is asthenopia. And those things are best evaluated by an ophthalmologist. And those can cause eye pain and headaches. Um, and then finally, blepharospasm. So these are patients that have uh, unconscious, repetitive blinking and squeezings of the eyelid, uh, oftentimes exacerbated by light. And uh, sometimes they can present with light sensitivity as their presenting symptom. So how are we going to approach this? So we've developed an algorithm for you to evaluate eye pain and photophobia when your examination is basically normal. Um, and so the first uh, is you have to really do a careful history, physical examination, and think about central processes uh, like head injuries, chronic illnesses, chronic pain conditions. Um, and look carefully on your exam for a Horner syndrome, so ptosis, meiosis. Check those cranial nerves carefully. Look for an afferent pupillary defect. Look for proptosis. Look for papilledema. Look for any neurologic finding. And if none of that is present, uh, which our patient, she had a normal MRI scan, she had a normal neurologic examination. So we fulfilled this whole section and it was all normal. So what's your next step? The next step, is to put a drop of proparacaine into uh, the eye of, of the individual with the eye pain and photophobia. And you can do this yourself, or you can ask an ophthalmologist to do this test. Is there any reason that you can't do this test, Dr. Katz? The only place where I could see you could mess up would be if your patient's wearing contact lenses, you might wanna have them take the contact lenses out first. But other than that, you're you're not going to do any harm putting a drop of a topical anesthetic in somebody's eyes. And then you ask them how much of the pain or light sensitivity is reduced. In our patient, it improved her eye pain a little bit, but it wasn't complete. She still had eye pain and she was still photophobic. All right, Dr. Katz, take us through what you do next to uh, evaluate further for dry eye. So if you're really suspicious that somebody uh, has dry eye as the cause of their light sensitivity and or eye pain, 
The next test was, would be what's called a Schirmer's test. And it's where a small piece of calibrated filter paper is put uh, just uh, inside the lower eyelid for five minutes. And this, again, is a test that ophthalmologists commonly do. And um, as an, you know, if you're a neurologist, you can work with your community ophthalmologist to ask them to specifically do this test. And uh, it's usually done with a drop of topical anesthetic. And then you set the timer for five minutes. And most people should be able to squeeze out 10 millimeters on the Schirmer strip in five minutes. And if it's anything less than that, then you've got an aqueous tear deficiency. You've got dry eye that needs to be treated. So our patient's uh, Schirmer's was one millimeter. That's dry. That's yeah. like that's like Sahara Desert dry, right? Yeah, and it's really surprising. You would think somebody with a Schirmer's test that's that low would um, have more like dry, they would complain that their eyes feel dry, scratchy, burny, but it's interesting that this patient had more like pain and light sensitivity. Yes. So then the next step is to look for things like hemolopia, meaning everything is too bright, or nyctalopia, meaning you have trouble seeing in the dark or decreased visual acuity. So night vision or vision that deteriorates in bright light. And this, I think we would all agree, we'd send it to the ophthalmologist for a good retinal exam because certain retinal dystrophies can have uh, a photophobia associated with them. And a retina specialist should be able to tell you whether that person has anything wrong in the retina. And our patient did not have these symptoms or findings. And then I, I really, uh, think you never want to miss blepharospasm. Uh, blepharospasm is that repeated blinking and sometimes squeezing, and sometimes it's spontaneous, uh, and sometimes it only comes out when light is suddenly shined into somebody's eye, and their, uh, their lids will clamp down and be very hard to open again. Uh, it's really an involuntary eye closure, and this can be treated with on a botulinum toxin, and our patient did not have this finding. And then at the end, you have to screen for migraine. Um, you know, uh, do they have headaches that have light and sound sensitivity, nausea and or vomiting and worsen with activity because migraine is so common. And if, and if they do at the end of this at a screening for migraine, you should also screen for depression and anxiety. And we'll tell you uh, about uh, how to do that, but also the importance of screening for those two things. Now, our patient did have a migraine history. We knew that right off the bat. And she does have some depression and anxiety. <clears throat> so in our, uh, uh, we did a study in uh, University of Utah Moran Eye Center and also at the University of Zurich asking what kind of, di what kind of diagnoses come into the eye clinic and the neurology clinic. So we had 20, uh, almost 2,400 patients. Uh, and we said, what were the diagnoses of the people coming in with eye pain? And they really were conjunctivitis, keratitis, dry eye was right up there. And then keratopathies, uveitis, uh, uh, post-surgical uh, findings, and even migraine in the eye clinic. In the neurology clinic, over half of the people had uh, migraine. Uh, optic neuritis was also really common. And then uh, the cranial neuralgias were also common. I'm sure that the eye clinic missed the migraines, and I bet the migraine or the headache clinic and neurology clinic missed the dry eyes because those are way more common and probably were more represented than were tested for. Now, there are lots of causes of photophobia, uh, and we've talked about all these anterior causes like iritis and corneal abrasion. Corneal neuropathies, I think, are really important to be aware of. Uh, uh, and these can happen with dry eyes. They can happen with all kinds of other corneal problems. Uh, and posterior causes. We talked about retinal dystrophies, albinism, achromatopsia, retinitis pigmentosa can present with uh, severe photophobia. Uh, and then brain causes like meningitis, uh, as well as pituitary tumors are, can also present. Even psychiatric conditions can present with photophobia, so uh, depression, uh, and ADHD, and there's a whole host of other conditions and even medications that have been associated with photophobia. 
But the most common causes of photophobia are going to be migraine, blepharospasm, traumatic brain injuries, and especially blast injuries are going to be your most common causes of photophobia. And I think this uh, is really an important study done by Tom Buchanan in our group late, earlier, many years ago, um, where we took people who came into the eye clinic with photophobia, 100 people, and uh, men and women, one of the highest causes of photophobia was migraine. The next highest cause was dry eyes, and then several other ocular conditions, and then trauma uh, also uh, uh, occurred as well, as well as progressive supranuclear palsy, uh, depression, and then there were some undiagnosed types. So our patient had a history of migraine. We found that she had dry eyes, and we think that the history of migraine, dry eyes were really driving her eye pain and photophobia. So then we have to ask the question, well, could migraine alone affect your vision and your visual quality of life? And in this study uh, done by one of our previous fellows, we took 29 patients with chronic migraine, 37 patients with episodic migraine with or without aura and controls, and we did several validated questionnaire instruments like the HIT-6, which is a migraine severity score, the um, 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 migraine quality of life score, the visual quality of life VFQ-25, and the NEI supplement. And uh, we found out something very interesting, that migraine alone uh, was almost a dose response curve. Chronic migraine had the lowest quality of life, visual quality of life. Episodic migraine had, the, uh, had lower quality of life than controls. So our visual quality of life in chronic migraine was similar to optic neuritis, Id idiopathic intracranial hypertension, and even thyroid uh, ophthalmopathy. So we showed that chronic migraine really has a profound effect on visual quality of life. And in this graph, we charted on the, um, on the y-axis, you can see the NEI VFQ score. And remember, high is good and low is bad. And the HIT-6 score, which is sort of a how bad is your headache, uh, where 80, uh, the, this end of the um, graph on this axis is the worst and 40 and less is better. You can see that the chronic migraine in the black here are the, have the lowest uh, scores, followed by the episodic migraine, and then of course the controls were better. But as the HIT-6 got worse, their visual quality of life also got worse. So um, what do you think Dr. Katz is driving this decreased visual quality of life in migraine? Well, to answer that test, uh, we uh, you know, to follow up that last study, we took uh, 54 patients from our headache clinic with uh, chronic and episodic migraine. Uh, we gave them the visual quality of life uh, survey from the NEI again, the headache impact test, and the ocular surface dryness index, the OSDI, as well as an instrument that we developed at the University of Utah called the Utah Photophobia Symptom Impact Scale. And uh, we found uh, that the thing that was most highly correlated with uh, increasing severity of headache and light sensitivity was the, was the dry eye survey, the OSDI. So if you look at visual quality of life, again, on the y-axis, a bigger number is a better quality of life. And then put it next to, on the x-axis, this ocular surface dryness index, which is a measure of dry eye symptoms with uh, worsening dry eye being a higher OSDI score. Um, that gave us the tightest correlation of all those instruments that we checked. And so what we think is driving the reduced VFQ, visual quality of life scores, in patients with migraine, especially chronic migraine, are dry eye symptoms. Yes, yeah, so dry eyes can affect both eye pain and photophobia. And we've just shown you that the visual quality of life is reduced in chronic migraine, that it's most cor closely correlated with these dry eye symptoms. 
But the question is, how could this even happen? And uh, Dr. Katz, take us, uh, or I'll take you through this. So let's just talk about the anatomy of the tear film. Uh, so to orient you here, we do need to understand the trigeminal system. So we have a trigeminal nucleus. And remember, the trigeminal system is the pain system for the eye. But not only do we have a nucleus that lives uh, in the brain stem, but we have the caudal, the trigeminal caudal nucleus uh, or the trigeminal uh, uh, complex, cervical complex. And these two systems are also connected to the autonomic system, the superior salivatory nucleus, uh, which is in the parasympathetic system. And then don't forget that we also have a sympathetic system that uh, comes up from the carotid, goes into uh, the orbit, and also uh, has a supply to the, auto, to the lacrimal gland and participates uh, as well in our, our tear film function. So the cornea is innervated by this trigeminal system and it can set up pain signals that go back through V1 and it can then connect with the autonomic system through the superior salivatory system to create more tears. And that's there's a reflex arc here that it can send a signal and then you're supposed to get more tears. Well, sometimes you don't get more tears either because the autonomic system isn't working right, the trigeminal signaling isn't working right, or the, the coupling of these two isn't working right. And so, so it's an integrated system of the autonomic system coupled with the uh, trigeminal system. And the cornea and dura, remember, are innervated by the first division of five. And so that means that both the dura that participates in migraine and sends microscopic, uh, has microscopic inflammatory changes that go into the trigeminal system can, can also have corneal input into that same system and set up almost a uh, sensitivity that could just be maintained by the trigeminal system. So Dr. Katz, uh, what do we know about the corneal nerves with chronic migraine? So this is kind of what got the whole ball rolling was, you know, because we know that the uh, uh, first division of five innervates the dura and is uh, strongly linked in migraine pathophysiology. And it's also what innervates the cornea. Um, we kind of uh, thought that confocal microscopy, which is a, a specialized technique that we can use to look at the corneal nerves, uh, could be affected in patients with migraine. So we took this cohort of 19 uh, patients with chronic migraine and 30 controls. Uh, we gave them uh, uh, the dry eye questionnaire uh, and then looked, used confocal microscopy to look at the nerves, the nerve endings from V1 in the corneas of these patients. And we found there were some very definite um, structural differences, which are highlighted on the next slide. Um, you can see uh, the control uh, nerves in the top uh, picture, and then patient, uh, a patient with chronic migraines in the bottom picture. The, the pictures in the right-hand column are from a uh, software package that uh, outlines the corneal nerves, looks for in, um, branching of the corneal nerves, measures the density of the corneal nerves in a specific slice. And we uh, found, you know, by testing all these different patients, that nerve fiber density, nerve fiber length, and nerve fiber, I'm sorry, nerve fiber density was very significantly affected in patients with chronic migraine. Nerve fiber length looked like it was a little bit different in chronic migraine, but it wasn't statistically significant nor was branching. But the, the most significant finding was this uh, finding that nerve fiber density was uh, less in patients with chronic migraine. And these findings have since been uh, uh, confirmed by a, another group outside of the university. We don't know if this is a chicken or an egg issue. We don't know if people with chronic migraine have abnormal uh, innervation of their cornea, or if abnormal innervation of your cornea leads to the development of chronic migraine, or or both. And it's interesting that in our patients, they had normal Schirmers and tear film breakup times, et cetera. So, you know, even though they um, had those normal studies, they still had these abnormalities on the microscopy. 
So it means that we have to add, besides the typical drawing that, that we use with the dural input into the trigeminal system and connecting with the autonomic system, we have to add the eye into this whole arc where the corneal afferents, for whatever reason, are can be abnormal in chronic migraine, but also in patients who have a lot of eye pain and uh, photophobia. Uh, other groups have hypothesized that there's a shared pathophysiology between dry eye, migraine, and traumatic brain injury because there's a shared trigeminal thalamic pathophysiology that alters, is altered and uh, uh, and it could be mediated by calcitonin gene-related peptide or other mediators that we really haven't quite identified yet. So the next question you might ask yourself is, I wrote down that you should ask about depression and anxiety. So is there a possible psychiatric component? For, for sure, many people for years thought anybody with photophobia, oh, these people are completely crazy. Well, people aren't crazy. Uh, uh, it, photophobia has been associated as a symptom of depression. And uh, some patients with migraine also have increased uh, incidence of depression and anxiety. And we asked the question, is there really an emotional component to photophobia? To answer that, we took migraine uh, individuals with migraine with and without aura uh, that had interictal photophobia. That meant their photophobia was there all the time and ictophotophobia, which meant that they just had episodic photophobia with their migraine only. And then we had controls who had no migraine and we did a Beck depression inventory and a Beck anxiety inventory. And this is what we found. We found those people who had interictophotophobia had a much higher depression, depression score than those with ictophotophobia and that was similar to controls. Ictophotophobia was just like controls, but when they had interictophotophobia, they had a much higher depression score. And similarly with anxiety, that their anxiety was also elevated with interictophotophobia versus the ictophotophobia, which was again similar to controls. And since our study was published, uh, another group has also confirmed this finding. And so to answer the question about eye pain and photophobia, what is it that we need to get this to happen? Well, we need the trigeminal system. I've already taken you through how important the trigeminal system is for dry eye. Uh, the trigeminal system is for migraine and, uh, and so on. But, but we've got to explain something else. We have to explain what the mediators are. CGRP is an attractive mediator for photophobia and eye pain because when mice are given CGRP, they demonstrate photophobic behavior. They, they try to get into the dark. And if you give them a CGRP monoclonal antibody, you can attenuate that response. Similarly, in humans, photophobia can develop within 30 minutes of a CGRP infusion. It comes in ahead of the actual head pain. So that would suggest that photophobia could, there could be a mediator here. And certainly we know in the cornea, there are many polymodal nociceptors that are activated in dry eye for sure. There can be upregulation of the TRPV1 channel and CGRP and TRPV1 are also connected. So this is an attractive mediator to look at for photophobia and eye pain. But how could we get light sensitivity? We have to explain an important conundrum. Do you need vision to have light sensitivity? And that question has actually been answered. Uh, Nozeda and, uh, and uh, others um, identified 20 migraine patients with either no light perception or light perception type of vision. So they were legally blind. And those with light perception and migraine could still be light sensitive. And to answer this question, we really need to turn to the intrinsically photoactive retinal ganglion cells and the melanopsin story. Dr. Katz, can you take us through what this story is all about? So uh, many of you will remember from uh, medical school that in your retina, you've got different layers. The innermost layer has the photoreceptors, the rods and cones, rods for night vision and cones for day vision and color vision. 
and they synapse with uh, another class of cells called bipolar cells, which then synapse with ganglion cells. And it's the ganglion cells whose axons actually leave the eye through the optic nerve and head back to the lateral geniculate nucleus where they synapse and then eventually send information back to occipital cortex. But right around the, the end of the 20th century, a subclass of ganglion cells was identified that's intrinsically photosensitive. In humans, it makes up about 2% of the population of ganglion cells. So these cells do not need input from rods or cones in order to be activated. If light hits them, they will start firing on their own. And the other thing that's unique about these ganglion cells is uh, that their axons don't go to the lateral geniculate. They go to other parts of the brain in uh, other parts of the thalamus uh, where they innervate pain centers. Uh, they go to the hypothalamus where they uh, regulate the circadian clock. And they also go back to the brainstem where they uh, innervate the Edinger-Westphal nucleus responsible for pupillary constriction. So it's this subclass of ganglion cells that, are, that have nothing to do with seeing or with vision, but that are very light sensitive. Uh, and we think that these cells are still active in our patients that have photoreceptor degeneration. So these patients are blind, they don't have any useful vision, but these ganglion cells still work and can still send pain signals uh, back to the thalamus. If you look at the um, uh, uh, a vertebrate photoreceptor uh, that contains rhodopsin, uh, it looks like the diagram over on the left and light polymerizes rhodopsin from its 11 cyst to its all trans configuration. And that causes you know, a cascade of enzymes to open up uh, sodium channels. Uh, I'm sorry, to close sodium channels in the photoreceptor. But if you look at the physiology of these uh, uh, intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, they don't contain rhodopsin, they contain melanopsin, which is also uh, a uh, a light sensitive molecule, it's isomerized by light. And if you look at the ion channels in the cell membranes of these cells, it looks more like an invertebrate photoreceptor than it looks like a rod or a cone. They're, uh, uh, in term, from an evolutionary standpoint, really interesting cells. Uh, now these cells uh, um, shown in the schematic here is the IPRGCs at the bottom, the purple cells. Uh, as I said, they send their axons to the suprachiasmatic nucleus where they um, uh, help and train circadian rhythms. Uh, they go to the edinger westphal nucleus in the back of the brainstem where they uh, help the pupil to constrict. And they also go to some pain centers in the posterior thalamus. And we think this is the photophobia pathway. We think it's these cells are sending their axons into pain centers in the thalamus. So that when you look at a very bright light, like it hurts. Like if you look at the sun, it physically hurts and we think it's these cells firing that cause that pain. And it's interesting to know that these cells still do receive input from rods and cones, including the red, green, and blue cones, but they do not need input from those cells in order to be activated by light. And also something that distinguishes these ganglion cells from other ganglion cells in the retina is that once they're hit by a pulse of light shown in the left uh, diagram, uh, when the light turns on, these cells start firing like crazy. And even after the light is shut off, they keep firing. And that's a unique property of these cells that distinguishes them from other ganglion cells. And if you look at the spectral sensitivity of these cells, uh, they run in that red line there. They sort of fall between green cones and blue cones in their sensitivity. They're maximally sensitive around 480 nanometers which is a wavelength that's sort of a blue-green part of the visual spectrum. And actually, in, you know, we've known for more than 20 years that a particular tint called FL41 can be helpful in patients with migraine, blepharospasm, traumatic brain injury, who exhibit light sensitivity, but we really never knew why. Um, and if you look at the spectral characteristics of this tint, which sort of like is a rose-colored tint, it is maximally attenuates light right around 480 nanometers, the same wavelength, almost exactly the same 
as the wavelength at which the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells are maximally sensitive. And we, we think, we don't know for sure, but we think that's why this tint is so helpful to people is because it helps shut down the light that's exciting those intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells that are then sending their axons back to the posterior thalamus and causing pain. And uh, so this article that came out really showed how melanopsin co-located with the trigeminal system. And that's why we think that uh, with melanopsin going with the trigeminal system, photophobia can occur and it can even occur in people without vision. Uh, animal models do help us understand the emotional component. For example, newborn blind mice ha only have melanopsin cells or the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells active up to post datal nine. If you shine light on these mice, they'll produce localiz vocalizations that are similar to being taken away from their litter or giving a noxious stimuli. But if you knock out melanopsin from these mice, they don't have this aversive behavior. So we know melanopsin is definitely involved in, in creating this uh, vocalization. But what I think is so amazing is that then when they've taken the mice and looked at their brain, they see early gene CFOS expression in the posterior thalamus where we expect it to be from the melanopsin cells, but also activation of the amygdala. And the amygdala is part of our whole emotional limbic system and uh, suggests that this uh, contributes to this emotional component. And so that leads us to understand eye pain and photophobia is somewhat of a circuit disease. We have the trigeminal system, both from the, from the cornea, but also from the dura, feeding into the trigeminal nucleus caudalis, which integrates then with uh, the, the melanopsin system or the intrinsically photoretinal ganglion cells uh, in the thalamus. There's some integration there. And this set system has a connection to the amygdala and the limbic system accounting for the depression. And there's even a sympathetic component to photophobia that we did not cover that uh, may also be important. But I think it helps us start to think about photophobia and eye pain as part of a, a whole circuit of, of, of disease. Now, the most important thing for all of us is how are we gonna treat people like this? Because if she's really disabled and not leaving her house, what can we do? And the first step I take is I explain why do you have these that they're symptoms. This is a real deal. This is not a made up symptom. People have a reason for having it. Um, all the people who throw on five pairs of dark sunglasses, close all their blinds, get in the dark, they need to come into the light because the more dark adapted you are, the worse light sensitivity is going to be. And then what about treating uh, dry eyes, Dr. Katz. What do you think about that? You know, for for patients with uh, dry eye symptoms, you know, even if you're not an eye doctor, you can't go wrong with uh, over-the-counter artificial tears. Um, we do prefer to use artificial tears that are preservative-free, but they they do tend to be a little bit more expensive. So other kinds of artificial tears are good, and um, the worst thing that can happen is nothing. So if you prescribe artificial tears to your patient and it doesn't help, you know, then you know you need to send them to an eye doctor to try to go to the next step. But you're, you're certainly not going to hurt anyone by using these over-the-counter preparations. Uh, for patients that need you know, more serious dry eye treatment, like the patient discussed, you know, presented earlier today with the Shermers of One, you know, they might need things like serum tears. So this is a um, uh, a treatment where the patient's own serum is spun off and put back in a sterile bottle and handed back to the patient. Uh, we sometimes use anti-inflammatories and some other in-office procedures that we can use to uh, maximize dry eye treatment and try to um, uh, cool off the trigeminal system that's being stimulated by chronic dry eye. And for sure, we could treat underlying migraine. We've got excellent preventative and acute treatments uh, for migraine. And if the patient has that, we need to maximally treat the migraine symptoms. Some of the treatments that have been proposed for photophobia uh, and even eye pain are on a botulinum toxin. Dr. Katz had a patient where he did on a botulinum toxin just for photophobia and a sensation of dryness in a patient 
uh, uh, who'd had a post-traumatic brain injury. But also, uh, this has been reported uh, in other cases. Um, Anticonvulsants have been reported anecdotally to be helpful, gabapentin and pregabalin. Uh, CGRP monoclonal antibodies anecdotally, anecdotally have also been found to be helpful. Sleep is really important for migraine and any pain disorder, and melatonin is an easy fix for somebody who's having a sleep problem. And I don't think we should forget treating depression and anxiety because depression can kill people uh, every day, and it's really important that we identify it and treat it. And then uh, sometimes sympathetic blocks uh, can also help with uh, photophobia and um, eye pain, chronic eye pain, especially if there's a regionally, if this is a regional pain syndrome like uh, disorder. What about devices, Dr. Katz? Do you know of any devices that can be helpful? You had so, mentioned FL41 earlier. Right. So as we mentioned, FL41, you know, seems to block the uh, uh, wavelengths of light that stimulate these intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. And there's there we have some good evidence uh, that these are helpful in uh, patients with headache. Um, we here at the university have shown evidence that it's helpful in patients with uh, blepharospasm, and we have some anecdotal reports of it being uh, helpful in patients with traumatic brain injuries associated with photophobia. It's important to know that these are not blue blocking lenses. In fact, in fact, if you look at the little blue arrow in our diagram here, FL41 actually transmits blue. It allows blue light to get through. Um, uh, that's not what's hurting the patients. It's this blue green light that's falling between the blue and the green uh, cone photoreceptors, it's important. So the blue blocking lenses that you find, you know, on sale on TV at, you know, in the early hours of the morning, that's not going to help these people. Um, you know, there are some uh, uh, supraorbital nerve stimulators. The Cephaly device is, uh, you know, is, is now available, I think, without a prescription. And yes. patients can try it on at home and see if it helps their light sensitivity, their eye pain, their headaches. Uh, and uh, TENS units can also sometimes uh, be inexpensive and used around the eyes can help patients with uh, eye pain syndromes. So I hope that we've told you that uh, photophobia and eye pain are very common symptoms. Everybody has a reason and you have to make the diagnosis of what that these symptoms are coming from, whether it's migraine, dry eye, blepharospasm, a retinal problem, pituitary tumor from the brain, et cetera. So you, you wanna make the right diagnosis as with any neurologic symptom. It has a real anatomic pathway. People aren't making this up. And we definitely need more studies to explore the complex interaction of melanopsin and the pathways of photophobia. And the trigeminal system is integral to the pain that people uh, experience. And I think you, we've been very clear about showing you how cornea and dry eye symptoms can contribute to this. And then don't forget this emotional component. We have, to, we have to treat depression. We have to treat anxiety because these can lead to deadly consequences. And it's really important that we do that. Um, and finally, boy, do we need some better treatments for this irksome condition. And the more research that we can do and the more uh, that we can share what works for our patients, the better. Uh, Dr. Katz and I would like to thank all of our collaborators. Over the years, we've been lucky enough to work with students, residents, fellows, uh, our colleagues at the Moran Eye Center, colleagues at the University of Zurich. And we especially want to thank uh, uh, funding sources and uh, especially the Mostigal family uh, for their help uh, in coming up with treatments and ideas for diagnosis and treatment of photophobia and eye pain. Thanks for joining us. Bye.